Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. When considering the advent of the Internet and the social or anti-social media complex, we think of names like Gates, Jobs, Zuckerberg, Page, Brin. Our guest today, Claire Evans, confounds the single-gendered understanding of the Net's founding in chronicles of the unsung women who blazed the trail, who made the Internet. The book is Broadband, just published by Penguin Random House a writer, musician, and founding editor of Terraform, Vice's science fiction vertical. Evans has published widely in The Guardian, Wired, and National Geographic. The intellectually rigorous, colorfully profiled women include Ada Lovelace, who envisioned a groundbreaking computing technology, Grace Hopper, the mathematician who invented a post-World War II programming language, Elizabeth Feinler, an internet administrator of the nascent web, Stacy Horn, the developer of a precursor to the Twitter Reddit message board, and Jamie Levy, who created the pre-USB floppy disk and published electronics magazines. Claire will explore the rich history of broadband and consider the stakes for both the citizen and women in the technological age. Welcome, Claire. Thank you. Nice to be here. Congratulations on this book. I know it's been a, a feat of two years in the making, right? Thank you very much. Yeah, it feels funny, but I'm happy. What was the most compelling anecdote among the women? Now, you had the opportunity to go into the archives of, of these um, pioneers. What did you find that most struck you? Um, was there one particular person, Ooh, ultimately? That's a big question. I mean, I think what I found to be really remarkable about this history, and really a lot of technology history is this way, where it's really not about individual accomplishment. It's not about the one person who invented the one thing. The internet is an interconnected you know, experience that we all share, and its development is much the same way. It's um, the consequence of concerted collaboration. Uh, it's driven by you, the, the desires and anxieties and fears and very human foibles of every single person that was involved. So I think sort of the discovery of the somewhat haphazard, intensely human, uh, intensely interconnected nature of the Internet's genesis, I think is the thing that fascinated me the most about all of this. It made me feel as though there was nothing really inevitable about the Internet as we have it today. What most resonated with you thematically in terms of these women's pursuit of technological advances? What, what can we relate to? Well, something that I f find to be quite remarkable is if you're looking for women in the history of technology, the history of computing or networked computing or the web, a lot of the time where you end up finding them or where I ended up finding them was concentrated at the very beginnings of major technological waves. So, for example, the invention of computer programming is something that is, I think, s squarely in the hands of women who were hired to essentially patch cables on the earliest computers and they were hired in the sense that, you know, they were, they were like secretaries or operators. They were like telephone operators. They were m manipulating the menial hardware. It wasn't considered to be a job of any significance, really. It was considered to be sort of an afterthought, sort of a clerical job. And yet, the moment they put their hands to it and their minds to it, they realized how much possibility there was, how actually the way that you input information into a machine and the way that you process it and the way that you design efficient systems for doing so can actually, you know, change the world. It's, it's an art form of its own. It's a language of its own. And so uh, it's only when programming became seen as something with value, something important after the dedicated work of a 
large number of female computer programmers that it was sort of it was given its own status that was commensurate with the status of engineering or hardware. Uh, and then, of course, perhaps that's the moment at which women lost grasp of, of the field. And that happens, that's happened again and again. And you see that at the beginning of every major wave, at the beginning of uh, sort of thinking about organizing information and networked computing. That was a space where women thrived and worked. Uh, the beginning of online communities, the very earliest waves of interactive media and publishing on the web, all of these spaces were spaces where, where women thrived. Uh, partially, I think that's just because they were places that perhaps were taken less seriously by the computer science community because things like hypertext and online community and you know information management, those things were seen as uh, being on par with the social social sciences, they were sort of softer than classical programming, and those user-oriented spaces uh, are places where people could get a toehold if they didn't necessarily have a rigorous education in computer science uh, and hadn't managed to make it, you know, all the way up the channels of academia. Uh, a woman could still find a way to contribute and participate in those in those early periods. So it's a lot of innovation. In, in the sort of dusty corners of underappreciated areas at the beginning of every technology. And I think a lot of that is also just due when there's no, when there's no precedent, when there's no canon, when there's no establishment quite there yet, a new technology actually affords a lot of freedom for people to define what it's going to be. And it's only then after it's been defined that it begins to take on an outsized role in society. Well, the one established hierarchy was the social construct. Um, then and maybe now too, uh -huh. of male-dominated uh, professional development, if you will. Uh -huh. But one thing that struck me is, is you identify the first ever advertisement at the <laughs> beginning of the book for a computer, but it wasn't necessarily a computer to an individual to compute. Yes, yes. Before a computer was a machine, it was a job. And it was a job that was practiced primarily by women. The job of computing, of performing computations, because you know, in the early days of organized science, if you wanted to get, you know, large numbers of, large amounts of computation done for, for example, you know, determining the arc of a, of a planet or, or maritime calculations or ballistics calculations, things that involve a lot of math, you couldn't just run that through a machine. You had to have, you had to do the math, you know, you had to actually do the math. And the people that actually did the math were groups of women working in computing offices in the 18th and 19th century. And they did much of the, you know, of the rigorous grunt work of science for, you know, for much of the of the beginning of the scientific age, and uh, essentially, eventually, replace themselves with with the machines that do that job today. But yeah. Has Google done doodles for any of these women? I'm pretty sure Google's been I pretty good about have, doing right? doodles. I mean, they have 365 days a year to cover, so there's plenty of people. I, I know there's been a, there's definitely been a Grace Hopper Google Doodle. Right. Certainly an Ada Lovelace Google Doodle. I did a little research ah, and, and found that a few of them were covered, but. Lovelace is the starting point, right? Yes. A in terms of translating the computing into some knowledge that could be uh, de developed mechanically. Mm -hmm. But for those who don't know anything about oh, her, what a can fantastic you, can you character! Share with our viewers. I mean, she's one of those people that I, is often trotted out as well. Here's the here's the original foremother of all computing, and it's I think an uncontestable truth. She she wrote the first computer program before computers in the mechanical sense existed. She was the daughter of the poet, Lord Byron, uh, a member of you know, Brit the Victorian aristocracy. She was married to the Count of Lovelace. She was an aristocrat in the days of you know, high society in, in London. And she absolutely hated it. You know, she never wanted to be that. She wanted to be a mathematician because she was obsessed with mathematics. Her mother had instilled in her from a very young age a love of mathematics, mostly because her mother wanted to keep her father's romantic tendencies sort of out of the mix because Lord Byron was famously kind of a louche character and um, you know he divorced Ada's mother after only a few years in order to pursue an affair with his half-sister. Anyway, that's, that's historical gossip. But Ada grew up in a household where mathematics and science were valued because they were seen as being kind of the opposite of poetry. And Unfortunately, she, for her mother anyway, Ada had a romantic mind and she saw mathematics in its highest form as a form of poetry, as something that had profound metaphysical value that could really change the world and articulate beautiful unseen mysteries of the universe. And so she th threw herself into mathematics her whole life. And when she was 19, I believe, met uh, Charles Babbage, who was the creator of a machine called the Difference Engine 
which was a very, very early computing machine, and really a machine in, in that sense of the word. It was made of, you know, bits of steel and brass. It was very sort of steampunky by today's standards, aesthetically, uh, designed to calculate, um, you know, mathematical tables for the British government. Nobody understood how it worked, and ultimately it was never finished uh, because it was far too ahead of its time, but she was really entranced by it and became Babbage's sort of diplomat in a way. Uh, he was a difficult character and not very good about articulating his ideas to the masses, and she believed in what he was doing, and so she wrote the notes that would eventually explain how his machines worked to the rest of the world. She was an advocate for him. She created mathematical proofs that could be run on his machines that formed the basis of computer programming as we know it today. So really a remarkable character. Uh, ultimately, she had kind of a tragic life. She died young, the same year as her father had in her mid-30s of cancer, which in those days everyone thought was just hysteria, a classic sort of feminine ailment of the Victorian age. But she articulated uh, the aspirations of software a the century before anyone really understood what that would mean. We do think of um, the technological advances not through the lens of a, of a uh, gender neutral um, <laughs> order. We, we think of kind of the names that have been lionized or... I think it's a couple of things. I mean, the things that the, our culture tends to value in technological innovation and you know, I think this is the consequence of a lot of marketing and also just perhaps our capitalist society. But, you know, the heroes that we look at that you mentioned at the top of the show, yeah. the Jobs and Zuckerbergs, these are people that either built physical machines like, like Steve Jobs, like created hardware that has a sort of lasting presence in the world because of its literal physical presence, because, it's a, because things are easy to point to and say, this is an object that has meaning. This is an object you can put in a museum. This is an object you can, that fills landfills with its, with its mass. Um, and this is because, because computer hardware is sort of defined by its continuous obsolescence mm -hmm. and the fact that we constantly have to replace it with more material hardware. You know, it's a lot easier to look at that stuff and the people that create that stuff as being significant because they're actually making like a, a physical impact on this world. They're mining rare metals and putting them into boxes that we put in our homes. Uh, software, which is what a lot of the women in my book at least are, are were responsible for articulating, is much more sort of mutable and strange and it doesn't have a physical presence in the same way. And it, it you know, software isn't preserved really with the same kind of fastidiousness as hardware is preserved. We don't think about software in the same way. It's, it's much more difficult to point to and say, you know, this is important because it's so ephemeral. That's one thing. Uh, I think the other thing is the sort of fantasy, the, the Silicon Valley fantasy of serial entrepreneurship, the fact that we value people that start companies that develop massive user bases and then sell their companies to other companies to start more companies or, or who IPO and make a lot of money and leave the industry. This, this sort of uh, much more entre entrepreneurial focus, which is also very masculine, I think. Mm -hmm. um, those are the things that we seem to value as a society, things and money and things that make money. But I don't know, what I admire the most about some of the women in this book is uh, that they have a much more sort of concerted interest in supporting the existence of the platforms and the software and the things right. that they create. That it's about developing a platform and then taking care of it and then right. maintaining it. Exactly. And sometimes that's not glamorous and that doesn't make you a lot of money, but maybe <laughs> you actually have much more of a significant impact on individual right. people's lives because you're building something with value that has an application to a real community. A absolutely. And I think it's the absence of that underpinning, mm -hmm. uh, nurturing the knowledge-based system mm -hmm. that plagues Web 2.0, 3.0, whatever it is now. Yeah. And, and someone like Elizabeth Feinler, who, you know, thought, conceived of an administrative way that we should think of the, the internet and mm -hmm. the digital analogy as a storage house of knowledge, right? Feinler is an interesting character for sure. I mean, she was, I mean, the earliest version of the internet as we know it, it was called the ARPANET. It was developed by the Department of Defense. Uh, it was designed for people in the academic computer science community to use resources at a distance. So there were obviously not a ton of women in that world because we're talking about the highest echelons of engineering and computer science and the military, not very, you know, right. predominantly male-dominated environments for all the reasons that 
we know. Uh, but there were women involved in the ARPANET in this sort of, again, sort of secretarial afterthought kind of capacity, which ended up becoming a really important capacity. Jake Feinler was one of these women. She ran what was called the Network Information Center, or the NIC, which was the primary central office for the internet, for the ARPANET, which sounds like nothing, but really, if you're thinking about the earliest version of network computing, there was no interface by which computer scientists could discover what resources were available to them on the network. They had to know, you know, if they wanted to use a computer, if a computer scientist at MIT wanted to use a machine in Berkeley, they had to know what was on that machine in Berkeley right. and who was running it and when it would be online and when it would be accessible. And the only way they could do that was by calling this office, the NIC, and saying, you know, hey, Elizabeth, what's, what's up with that machine in Berkeley? Can I use it and when? And she would have all the resources. So she knew what everyone was doing everywhere on the network. And anytime somebody wanted to add a machine to the network, they had to call her office and make sure that all the protocols were right, make sure that they had all their paperwork straight, and she would assign them a space on the network. So she was the administrator of, of space, of, host ta of the host table, it was called, like the host table was a sort of index of all of the host computers. Um, she knew everybody, you know, she kept the, the, the yellow pages and the white pages of the early internet together, which were originally print documents, but eventually became part of the network itself. So for 25 years, there was a phone at the NIC that was the phone number for the internet. And if you had a question about the internet, you called that phone. And she answered that phone, and her staff answered that phone for, for two decades. And she knew before anybody that you know, the real significance of this network wasn't going to be about sharing computing muscle for you know, engineering projects. It was going to be that it was an information network and it was something that was going to connect people with one another. What can we learn about these women, Feinler and others, in the way that they had hoped to direct digital technology and, and it hasn't gone their way, it hasn't gone in that direction? I mean, there's lots of forces at play that are beyond just individual contributions. But, you know, well, first of all, we should make a distinction between the internet and the web because that's a very common yes. thing. The internet is the infrastructure that underlies the web. The web is a visual platform built on top of the internet, and they're quite different. Um, the internet was developed by computer scientists. The web was developed by physicists and computer scientists, and they both, the, I mean, the, the great similarity between the two is that they both immediately exponentially grew because people, whenever people are connected, they want to continue connecting. Whenever two machines are connected, people are using it to send emails to each other or send messages right. to each other or connect with each other because we are tribal, we are social beings, we, we love to connect with each other over distance. But there are many things about the experience of the early internet and the early web that sort of, its limitations are what made it interesting, I think. I mean, if you were using dial-in online services in the late 80s and early 1990s, there was a sort of uh, geographical fencing that would happen because it would be more expensive to call, for example, a bulletin board system on the West Coast if you were on the East Coast than it would be to dial into a system locally. So people tended to, even though they were using the network to connect with each other, there were a lot of smaller communities that were isolated from one another and were localized and were rooted in local uh, environments. With, you would be interacting with people that you stood a chance of meeting in real life that you might... Uh, you know personally, in fact. And that, I think, is a very interesting lost part of the internet, the fact that people used to be able to connect with one another uh, without anonymity, like that they knew each other and they, had, they stood the chance to know each other. And perhaps when we start dealing with a network where everyone is on equal footing inter globally, it's very difficult to be responsible for what people are going to do and what people, how people are going to behave with one another. There's much less accountability. And ultimately, I think that's what drive some of the darkest corners. Although, to be honest, there's been, there's been bad actors online since the very beginning. You look at one of the people I chronicle in the book, Stacey Horn, who started an online community in New York City in the late 80s. She had Nazis, she had trolls, she had stalkers, she had all kinds of, all, everything that we have today, she had, a smaller scale, of course, but uh, it's all, it's all the good and the bad come together and always have. So I think it's- But it's, they were it's, not empowered they were not empowered in the same way, of course. And 
And the administrators of a platform like Echo had the ability to just say, hey, get out of here. Like, you're, you're fired. You can't be on this network anymore because things were more localized. So what that. kind of solutions did they foresee or do you, channeling their creative energies, <laughs> foresee? We were talking a bit off camera. I said, I don't even want to use the word ecosystem anymore as it pertains to digital mm -hmm. because it's been cannibalized by parasites. And we really question whether or not there is something living that can be nurtured anymore <laughs> on the web. I mean... I think a lot of it comes down to money. I mean, a lot of the people that built these early versions, I mean, the early internet was built for academics. And it wasn't about profit. It wasn't about creating commercial platforms. The earliest online communities were made for the love of it, really. I mean, you people, people dialed in and paid for the privilege of doing so, but it wasn't something that anyone was getting rich doing. Um, and the earliest contributions to the web were done for the fun of it by people who were excited by the medium. I think, you know, Efforts to try to understand how to monetize these platforms have ultimately led us down a very dark path. If you look at the earliest web publishing experiments, for example, when people first started publishing magazines on the web, they thought they were going to get rich right away because people paid money to subscribe to magazines. And if you had a magazine online, you wouldn't have to actually warehouse print issues of magazines. So you could just sell subscriptions infinitely to something ineffable and that would be like you'd be making money hand over fist because you wouldn't have to actually print magazines you would just put them on the internet and you could sell subscriptions forever and never run out of magazines and so that was that was the the original sort of delusion about what you know how people would make money online then it became very clear that the amount of free content on the internet was going to make that impossible as a proposition so then it became about advertising selling ads online you know People sold ads online, made a lot of money. Ultimately, that didn't quite get there. So now we're in a place where we've sort of hybridized community and publishing by selling you know, user demographic data to advertisers about the users on a community. It's a weird way of existing. That you're sort of monetizing by exploitation of the community that you're trying to serve. I mean, it's like I always say, if you're not, you know, if, uh, if you're not paying for the service, you're the product. Right. And that's the tricky thing about life online now, is you're always being sold to or sold. It's, right. how can you build a healthy ecosystem that way? Right, right. Well, it's not a mystery to me, Claire, <laughs> that the three women executive directors of Wikipedia who've uh -huh. appeared in where you're sitting have stewarded a more knowledge-based internet and it's not a mystery to me that the woman executive director and chairperson of the Mozilla Corporation, these people who really are at the helm of what I like to call the Good Samaritan Internet, <laughs> um, they're women. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Wikipedia is a great example. Whenever people ask me about you know, what part of the Internet I, I, I like today or I see sort of commonalities between contemporary usage and the sort of earliest aspirations of cyber culture, Wikipedia is one of them, because that's really about the sort of collective pursuit of knowledge, which was the, which was the point of it all to begin with, wasn't it? Right. And is there some inspiration you hope your readers uh, take away in their pursuit or application of technology? Uh, of course, the, the women who have led Wikipedia um, are stars and um, Firefox is the one example of a nonprofit browser that won't monetize your privacy or personal data. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your hope uh, from the reader's perspective um, that this may lead them to some kind of further pro-social? I mean, for me, the hopes, I have several hopes. <laughs> uh, I want to believe that a better internet is possible. I think it is. I think part of allowing people to sort of let that possibility into their spirits is understanding, you know, that a better internet could have been possible if we had just taken, made a few different decisions in history. That's the thing that blows me away about this history is that there are so many kind of parallel futures that you can see in these stories. Like if, if for example, the early hypertext systems that were developed by women that were eventually displaced by the web, if those had taken the place of the web, what kind of world would we be living in? A different one. And those are just, you what know. What would it be, look like? Who knows, but. Uh, would it, just for our viewers who yes. are not as familiar with the lingo, what would be the okay, qualitative so, difference? So the way in that. The, in the minutes we have left. Yes, yeah, so the way. Seconds. That, okay, I'll try to jam it in. Yeah. So the way that the web works is 
it's built around the concept of links, right? Which right. that's what hypertext is. It's it's the convention of linking ideas together. But before the web became the hypertext system that we all know and love, there was meant there was a decade of research being done about how best to approach this question of turning data and information into practical practical knowledge, useful knowledge, how to create connections within it all that would be practical and applicable to human life. Uh, it was pretty much agreed within those communities that links should always go two ways. That if you've connected something, you should be able to connect back to where you came from. And that links should be not contextual, not embedded in the documents, but this larger kind of meta information. Because the connection between two ideas is as valuable a, a, a piece of information as the individual ideas themselves, right? Knowing what brings, what, knowing what connects two things is a very useful piece of information. It's, it's meta information, essentially. Uh, and following a thread like one would on a Wikipedia deep dive where you go from one link to the next, following a thread through a series of historical periods, ideas, movements, concepts, is an incredibly valuable thing. And sharing that thread with other people is valuable. So The alternative, though, the alternative would have been something perhaps more contextual? No. Well, if, if we had gone with the way that people understood hypertext to work in those days instead of the way we built the web, uh, we would not ever have a broken link. We would never have a 404 error. If a website today disappears or is moved or is hidden behind a paywall, that, the, whatever links to it, it, that link becomes broken. So that piece of information is gone. And that is, I think, a huge loss to our culture and to our, to our you know, the knowledge of, of humanity. So these earlier systems were designed in such a way that that would never happen. So perhaps we would have a sort of more holistic, more information-driven, more humane kind of convention on the way. More humane. More humane. That's the goal. Thank you, Claire. <laughs> um, I appreciate you being here with me today. Thank you for having me. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Anne Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Angelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and to the corporate community Mutual of America.